Hello everyone this is part 10 of what if Naruto was banished and becomes rakage, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to see more comment down below. Minutes of the Rakage giving the order to go, a fleet of 20 airships along with the Rakage's personal airship leading the fleet rose out of the crater of an extinct volcano. The volcano was near the Kaminari no Kuni border and had been converted into a secret hidden military base. At the same time that the airship fleet was rising up into the air two massive doors disguised as large rocks at the base of the extinct volcano opened up, revealing a large wide entrance way. As soon as the doors opened up a force of well over 2,000 Kumo Shinobi started pouring out of the entrance at top Shinobi speeds and in tight formations. Once both the air fleet and the army of Shinobis were all out and in formation, the Rakage gave the order for all forces to move out. After which the air fleet and the Kumo force moved forward. New Kumo and the Heavenly Alliance had now officially joined the fourth great Shinobi world war and were now on the warpath. Leaving only one question, whose side were they on? Eight days later in Kanoa for the past 12 days, since Jiraiya informed Sunid of Orokimaru's major assault, Kanoa had been preparing for battle. The surrounding forest had been filled with shinobi traps, the hospital staff and equipment had been moved into the shelters inside the Hokage monument as the hospital itself was not secure enough. The village itself was fortified with dozen of houses and building made into temporary bases of operations and command posts for the different shinobi groups, shinobis were also stationed around the clock on the Kanoa walls. In the event that Orokimaru and his allies sent in a vanguard or raiding party to weaken Kanoa before it had a chance to defend itself. The civilians along with all non-combatants were evacuated out of the village and brought into hidden shelters built into a nearby mountain and were guarded by a platoon of Anbu. Many of the shinobis staying in the village had said goodbye to their parents, lovers, wives and children, when they left the village. Lee, Yakumo had left the daughter Fuku along with Kurenai's son Haruzen in the care of Fuku's nanny, who was a member of the branch part of Yakumo's clan. Shikamaru also sent his pregnant wife Shiho with Choji's wife and the other civilians who were leaving so that both she and their child would be safe. Aruka and Anko also sent the daughter Aiko with the evacuees and left her in the care of some civilian friends of Aruka. After about six days upon learning of the coming attack, Jiraiya arrived back to Kanoa although he did not have much to report other the Orokimaru and his forces were getting ready to move. But he had received word from the Godime Kazekage, Gara that he and his forces would arrive the day that Orokimaru began their attack. He also stated that Gara would be coming with 3,000 of his shinobis, which was 60% of Suna's military force. While leaving the remaining 2,000 shinobis in Suna, to defend Suna in case they lost their battle and to give Suna a chance to still defend itself. Gara had not changed too much in the past 10 years, after the event with the Akatsuki and nearly dying, Gara decided that he needed to get stronger so to better protect his village and his people. During the following seven years after his kidnapping Gara trained in Taijutsu, Sealing and Kenjutsu, where he became quite skilled in all three areas. One, he also learned to control the Ichibi no Shukaku, one-tailed Shukaku power better and was able to use its power to its full extent, without the demon taking control over him, which was made easier thanks to the seal his mysterious saviors placed on him. To give Gara and his forces time to arrive in Kanoa and be rested enough to fight in the coming battle, Sunid had ordered Shikamaru's father Shikaku to create effective delaying strategies to delay Orokimaru and his allies, which he did. He had shinobi teams destroy the main roads to Kanoa, as well as set up effective shinobi traps, like Genjustu fields so that if enemy shinobis entered certain areas they will either collapse unconscious or become lost. He also stationed small shinobi teams on the most likely traveled paths that Orokimaru and his allied forces would take, so that the teams could make small hit and run attacks against them, so to reduce their numbers and slow them down. At the same time about 60 or so shinobis from the Suchigamo clan arrived in Kanoa and were led by Hotaru the granddaughter of Enno Gyoja, to help Kanoa. On the seventh day that the attack was learned by Kanoa, Sunid learned from her scouts along the coastal shore of Hai no Kuni, Fire Country, and the borders of Ta no Kuni, Rice Field Country, and Kusa no Kuni, Grass Country, that Orokimaru and his allies were on the move, right on schedule. 
When the invasion force from Kiri landed on the coastal shore of Hai no Kuni just south of Nami no Kuni, wave country, as they landed many of their shinobis were killed by exploding notes that had been planted underneath the sand of the beach. Shikaku had correctly calculated the correct position where Kiri's invasion force would land, as it was the best landing place for a force that sized to land. As well near enough to Kanoa so that they would surround Kanoa with the other forces of the Orokimaru's coalition at roughly the same time. At the same time the forces from Oto no Kuni and the Hanya clan moved from their bases in Ta no Kuni and crossed the border of Hai no Kuni where they attacked the Kanoa outposts and bases along the border, but when they did, they discovered that the bases had exploding notes planted in them. So that when the invading forces entered the outposts and bases they would blow up, causing many casualties among the forces. The same thing happened to the forces of Iwa and Kusa when they crossed the border between Kusa no Kuni grass country, and Hai no Kuni. The three separate forces also came under several raids and hit-and-run attacks from Kanoa shinobis as they headed towards Kanoa, the teams were led by members of the Huga clan, Abareng clan, Inazuka clan and Anbu. These attacks along with the traps that Kanoa forces set up and the roads and paths that they destroyed slowed the invading forces down by two days, given Kanoa five days to continue to prepare for battle, as it would take three days on foot for the enemy to get to Kanoa. This gave Garar and his forces enough time to arrive in Kanoa and rest up as well as integrate themselves with Kanoa forces so that they could help with the defenses. On the twelfth day upon Kanoa learning of the attack, Orokimaru and his allies were now in position and ready to begin their attack on the village. They had placed their forces all around the village and placed all twelve large mobile volley guns, which Kiri had brought with them, and placed them around the village so that they could bombard the village before they began their main attack, they even loaded new poisons from Kusa in with the volley guns so to weaken the Kanoa and Suna forces. From a small hilltop looking over Kanoa, Orokimaru and his allies, the Yondaim Suchikich, Ryoku, the Godai Mizukich, Shiro, the leader of Kusagaku, Doku and the leader of the Hanya clan, Shinran, commanded their forces. The forces themselves were positioned in different areas around Kanoa, the Kusa and Hanya clan forces were on the western side of the village, the Iwa forces on the southern side of Kanoa, Kiri forces positioned at the eastern side of the village. While the Oto forces were positioned in a hidden location behind the rest of the army, ready to move out on their leader's command. As Orokimaru looked over his former village, he started to laugh, Ku, 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 I have waited for this day for many years. As have I, spoke Ryoku with a smirk of his face as he was going enjoy finally burning Kanoa to the ground and taking his revenge of the once mighty village. As have we all, said Shinran, as he too was eager to finally kill Danzo and reap his revenge on Kanoa. So shall we begin, asked Doku as he was eager to get started. Yes I believe we should, replied Orokimaru, where he then turned to the Mizukage, Shiro-kun would you be so kind as to begin the festivities. At this a sadistic smirk appeared on the godai Mizukage face and nodded where he turned to his aide and told him to fire the poison-carried bombs. The aide nodded and then spoke onto the radio and told the Kiri forces below to be fire the first volley of kunai with large pouches filled with the new poison powder from Kusa tied to them. As soon as the order was given, the shinobis stationed at the volley guns unveiled the volley guns as they were covered in camouflage during the night after certain parts of the forestry were cleared to allow the volley guns to fire. After the camouflage was removed the volley guns opened fire their load and bombarded the village with the poison, covering it in a purple poison cloud. Unfortunately though for Orokimaru and his allies, the poison had no effect on the Kanoa and Suna shinobis, as during the initial raids against the advancing enemy coalition several Anbu agents were able to get a sample of the new poison from a Kusa supply convoy they had attacked. Upon receiving the sample of the poison Sunid, Shizun and Sakura used their combined medical skills to quickly synthesize an antidote to the poison and mass produce enough of it to give out to the defenders. After the firing the poison into the village, the Kiri forces at the volley guns reloaded and began to fire a new bombardment on the village, hoping to level the village and take out most of its resistance. For the first two minutes the village was under massive assault from the bombardment and many buildings were destroyed but it did little damage to the shinobis inside the village as Kanoa had several large underground bunkers made in different parts of the village, when the war first began. This allowed the majority of the defenders to stay safe until the bombardment ended. After a few minutes Shikamaru, who was on the command post along the wall western part of the Kanoa wall, had one of the shinobis next to him send up a flare to signal Yamato and Sai to take out the volley guns. 
Shikamaru plan was to wait and have the village take the bombardment so that he could learn the number and locations of all the volley guns. Once he learned this and they knew the locations of all the volley guns, Shikamaru then had Yamato and Sai taken them out as they were the best suited to destroy them. Hiding above the clouds on his large ink bird, Sai waited for Shikamaru to radio him the positions of the volley guns and then signal him. Once he saw it he then had his ink bird quickly swoop down on the volley guns, and drop explosives down on six of the volley guns and destroyed them, after which he then quickly returned back to the village. At the same time Yamato destroyed the remaining six, where when he learned the location of the other six volley guns from Shikamaru through the radio and then saw the flare signal. He then used his Mokuten powers to send dozens of large wooden tentacles underneath the ground and covered in explosive notes so that when the tentacles reached the locations of the volley guns, they would spring out of the ground underneath the volley guns and impale themselves into them. Before the exploding notes on them exploded, destroying the volley guns and killing their crews at the same time. When the leaders of the anti-Kanoa coalition saw this, most of them remained unaffected by what happened. Although Shiro frowned slightly, while Orokimaru chuckled as if amused at what happened. Ku, ku, ku. Coup, it seems that Kanoa will put up a fight after all. Indeed, but that will just make our victory over them all the sweeter, when we crush them, as even if they and the allies fight on we will destroy them, spoke Ryoku. At this the other leaders of the coalition nodded in agreement, where Ryoku then stated that they begin the main assault, which the other agreed to. After which, each of the leaders told their aides to inform their forces bellow to begin the main attack. From there, small groups of shinobis from the different invading forces positioned themselves in summon seal formations and all had special summoning scrolls, where they each summoned their giant summons to help the breach the Kanoa walls from different points. At the southern side of the village several Iwa shinobis were around the summoning circle with a scroll in each their hands. Once they had gathered the necessary amount of chakra, and had each done the hand seals. They quickly slammed their hands on the ground and cried out Kuchio's no jutsu summoning technique. After which there was a massive puff of smoke appeared and a sloth two of five bears appeared three. At the same time at the western side of Kanoa a group of Kusa shinobis were doing the same thing but instead of summoning bears they summoned three, three-headed snakes, the same kind that were used in the attack on Kanoa by Suna and Oto. Also at the moment at the eastern side of the village the Kiri Shinobis, who were doing the same thing as the Kusa and Iwa Shinobis, summoned four giant snakes. As soon as all the summonses on the three sides had been all summoned, the summons charged forward, at the gates and walls in front of them. The giant summons quickly broke through the gates and walls and started to destroy the surrounding buildings, meeting no resistance. As soon the giant summons had broken through surrounding walls the forces on the three sides quickly sent in a hundred shinobis. So to see what kind of resistance, they would be up against, if there was any. Soon after the trio of three-headed snakes had broken through the western side of Kanoa Wall, they then began destroying the surrounding buildings, but soon enough a voice suddenly shouted out, Raten, Shichu Shibari, lightning style, four pillar bind. After which four giant rock pillars shot out of the ground around one of the three-headed snake, where they then shot bolts of lightning, immobilizing it and started doing damage to it. It was then when the giant three-headed snake was immobilized, the person who caused the jutsu appeared revealing him to be the Anbu captain. Upon seeing the giant snake summon trapped, the Anbu captain then did a few more hand seals, where he then cried out, Doten, Nensuki Otoshi, Earth style, sticky earth drop. This created an opening in the sky and dropping down onto the three-headed snake, a large amount of mud, covering it and subsequently immobilizing it at the same time. The Anbu captain followed up with another set of hand seals and cried out, Brayton, Jurokuchu Shibari, lightning style, 16 pillar bind. After which creating 16 giant pillars around the mud-covered snake summon, which then formed a giant oven-like structure to trap the giant snake summon trapping it inside. Once the snake summon was trapped inside the giant oven, the Anbu captain, then followed up with another set of hand seals and cried out, Katen, Suyaki no Jutsu, fire style, fired pottery technique. This created powerful flames inside the giant oven and causing the mud that was covering the snake's body to harden, further immobilizing him, and allowing the fire to cook the three-headed snake's body until it was burnt to a crisp. Once the first three-headed snake was dealt with, a female voice shouted out Kuchio's no jutsu, where the queen of the slug summons Katsuyu appeared to face the pair of three-headed snakes, with her summoner the god I'm Hokage Sunid standing onto of her. 
Also with her was the god I'm Kazekij Gara, who now appeared alongside Katsuya in his full Shukaku form and was in complete control of it. Thanks to the new seal he had gotten from his mysterious saviors and thanks to the several year of intensive training he went through to suppress Shukaku influence and control its power effectively. After appearing, both Godaim cages of the two great villages went and attacked the two remaining three-headed snake summons. As this was happening of the southern side of the village, the bear summons on the southern side of the village, that the Iwashinobi summoned, met with resistance. Where the ground underneath one of the bears exploded and the bear fell into a massive hole, after which a large explosion erupted in it and killed the bear summon. After that Choji, his father Choza and three other Akamaiki clan members used their Cho Baika no Jutsu, super multi-size technique, to increase their size, where they then engaged the four remaining bear summons. On the eastern side of the village the four giant snake summons, were rampaging through village and destroying everything in their path. As this was happening, a voice suddenly shouted out, Kuchios, Yatai Kuzushi no Jutsu, summoning, food cart destroy technique. After which Gamabunta the chief of the toad summons appeared from the air and landed on one of the snake summons and crushed it. Atop Gamabunta was Jiraiya, who was now in the middle of his introduction dance and shouting out, listen up, you chicks. Open your beady little eyes and take a good look. Behold, the divine ninja Jiraiya's, far east of Eden's, wild dance. Upon seeing this, the remaining three snakes, did not know what to do, after seeing this and did not move. Seeing that the snakes had yet to do anything, Jiraiya continued on with his introduction, you damn snakes that are frozen with fear in a toad's presence, get out of here. It was after this intro, that two more Jiraiya's appeared where they each did a few hand seals and cried out, Kuchios no Jutsu, and summoned two more of the great battle toads Gamakan and Gamahiro. After that the two Jirai then puffed away revealing that they were shadow clones. When the three great battle toads arrived, they quickly drew out the various weapons that leaped forward and attacked the remaining three giant snake summons. At the same time that all this was happening, the advance forces of the shinobi sent into Kanoa by the anti-Kanoa coalition leaders to support the summons entered the breaches and charged forward. As they moved further into the village they were quickly engaged by the frontline defenders of each breach, the defenders were made up of a mixture of Kanoa, Suna and Tsuchigamo clan shinobis. After a few minutes of fierce fighting the advance forces of shinobis that were sent in were being pushed back. As they had not expected to meet up with such heavy resistance from the defenders, as they had believed that the defenders would be weakened and helpless from the poison gas fired into the village. From their command point on the hill Orokimaru and his allies watched the fight as it quickly turned against them. Impossible. How can they be able to fight so well? We used a completely different poison from the one we used at Nami no Kuni, Wave Country, so there no way that they could have created an antidote for it. The poison should have left them as weak as newborn babies by now. Spoke Doku angrily, as he was both confused and angry at how an easy victory was now turning into a bitter hand-to-hand -hand street battle. I found it wise in recent years, never to underestimate the resourcefulness of Kanoa nor Sunid's medical skills. As clearly she has somehow found a way to make her forces and allies immune to it, spoke Orokimaru seriously with a slight frown. Deciding quickly Orokimaru and the others decided to send in the first wave of shinobis as the coalition forces around Kanoa were spilt into five separate waves. With each wave containing about 3,000 shinobis and each force at each breach sending in about 1,000 shinobis in at the same time as the other forces. As the first wave charged into the breaches the Kanoa shinobis and their allies held the ground and made the invading shinobi fight for every inch of ground in the village that they took. With Tenten Tenten was currently at the eastern side of the village wearing her standard Anbu outfit and falcon-shaped Anbu mask, she was leading her own team and several other Anbu teams in ambushing a platoon of Kiri Hydra, four members that had broken through the front line air. Quickly Tenten positioned her teams in the designated places and once they were in position, they waited for the Hydra members to arrive. They did not have long to wait, since only after a few minutes of waiting the platoon arrived. As soon as they did Tenten quickly gave the signal to the rest of her teams. Quickly Tenten and her personal team appeared in front of the advancing Hydra platoon and threw several kunai and shurikens at the Hydra members, killing three of them and causing the rest of the Hydra members to stop in their tracks. You will not take another step further into our village, so get out of here, cried Tenten as she charged forward with the rest of her team. At the same time the other Anbu teams that Tenten lead came out of their hiding spots and attacked the enemy platoon from all sides. 
Tenten quickly drew out her katana and slashed at nearby Hydra member killing him, quickly spinning around Tenten through a kunai that had suddenly appeared in her hand, into the air. Where it then flew in the air with great speed and stabbed the HYRDA ninja in the neck, who was in midair and was about to kill Tenten with his katana. Within minutes most of Hydra platoon had been killed by Tenten and her teams, but just as Tenten had killed off another Hydra member, her shinobi senses suddenly kicked in and told her to move. Luckily for Tenten she listened to her senses and moved and just as she did a tall, thin, dark cloaked figure wearing a dark hat appeared in the spot she was just in and slashed at her. When Tenten landed a few feet away, the blade of her katana split in two, while her anbu mask split in half, where a small trickle of blood fell from her forehead, showing she had been cut slightly there. Quickly the anbu under Tenten's command appeared next to her to see if she was okay and to support her. Tenten Taiko, are you all right? asked Tiger. I'm fine Tiger, just a cut, replied Tenten as she threw away her broken katana and stared at the new arrival. Impressive, you were able to avoid my attack with only that scratch, not many people have been able to dodge one of my attacks like that, but then again I would expect nothing less from the famed Okami Ken no Kanoa Kanoa's blade mistress. Who are you asked? asked Bird openly and angrily. But before the stranger could reply to Bird's question, Tenten answered for him, his name is Udo Jin better known as Kurogasa Black Hat. He's the leader of the Hydra division and is the last remaining loyal member of the current Kiri no Shinobagatana Nananenshu, Seven Swordsmen of the Mist. Upon hearing this, the Anbu members stiffened and prepared to fight, as they had all heard infamous assassin of Kiri as well as his mastery in the assassin sword style Nikaido Haiho. At this a sadistic and cruel-like laugh erupted from Jin, so you've heard of me I flattered. Don't be, as from what I heard about you, makes me wish I hadn't, replied Tenton coldly as from the stories that she had heard about the man told her that he was a sadistic sociopath. He enjoyed killing and had no moral issues with what he had done and did not care who it was he had to kill whether it be men, women or children as long as he just got to kill. I have heard that you wanted to kill me for a while now, spoke Tenton. At this Jin smiled sadistically, yes I have, no doubt Rajuta told you that before he was killed by the rakage at Nami no Kuni, which I glad he did as now I can have the pleasure of killing you myself. We won't let you, cried Wolf as he and three other Anbu charged forward at Jin. No wait, stop, shouted Tenten as she tried to stop them, but it was too late. Jin quickly disappeared right before the Anbu eyes and like a blur slashed through three of the Anbu, with quick efficient slashes and without giving them the slightest chance to defend themselves. After killing three of the Anbu, Jin sped towards the wolf with speed that could easily rival Guy and Lee without their weights, where just as he was about to sever Wolf's head off. But before he could, Tenten appeared between them and blocked Jin's slash with her Jian sword, after which she then slashed at Jin with the spike ends of her of metal fan in and attempted to cut his neck open. Jin though narrowly avoided the slash, although he did have a slight cut on the side of his necks, which bleed a little. Upon seeing this Jin smiled sadistically, not bad, it's been a long time since I've seen my own blood. At this Tenten narrowed her eyes, knowing that this would not be an easy fight, and without even turning to look at Wolf or the other Anbu teams Tenten spoke to them. Wolf, I want you and the others to leave here and go help defend the village, while I handle him. Taiko, you can't be serious. We can't leave you here, to fight him, spoke Wolf. That's an order Anbu. He wants me not you, and if you stay here you just get in the way as none of you stand a chance against him. I can handle him by myself, besides we need every shinobi we have out there fighting if we want any chance of winning this battle so go. Cried Tenten. At hearing this, the Anbu nodded and moved out to the front line at the eastern side of the village. When the Anbu left both Tenten and Jin fell into the different sword stances, after which they said or did nothing and just stared at one another. They continued to stare at one another, doing nothing, while the battle raged on around them and sounds of explosions going off in the distance. The two of them waiting for the other to make the first move, waiting to see which of them would make the first mistake. After a few minutes of just staring at one another, until Jin decided to speak, so shall we begin. At this Tenton did not reply and just waited, a moment later a massive explosion equated nearby, as soon as it did, both Tenton and Jin charged at one another, with incredible speed, where they then clashed swords with one another and began their battle to the death. With Konohamaru Konohamaru was currently leading a group of Chunans in holding back the several teams of Iwa Shinobis that had broken through the main defense line at the southern part of the village. 
Konohamaru quickly engaged an Iwanin, where the two of them, fought bitterly against one another, where they traded blows with one another. During the fight Konohamaru quickly flipped backwards to avoid a horizontal slash from the Iwanin's kunai, whereas he flipped backwards he kicked the Iwanin right underneath the chin. Thereby knocking several teeth out of the Iwashinobi's mouth and sending him flying into the air and crashing to the ground unconscious. Once he got back on his feet Konohamaru quickly turned to another Iwashinobi coming at him from behind. Quickly spinning around and ducking the Iwashinobi's kunai stab, Konohamaru quickly did a Raisingan in his right hand, and slammed it right into the unsuspecting Iwanin's stomach, shouting out, Raisingan. After being hit with the attack the Iwanin was sent flying away and blasted right thrown a nearby wall. Just as he defeated that Iwanin, Konohamaru's shinobi senses told his to duck which he thankfully did, since as soon as he ducked a kunai flew right through the spot where his head was just moments ago. Quickly doing a 160 degree turn, Konohamaru quickly located the Iwanin that shot him, who was about 80 feet away on a rooftop with a Kwani. Seeing this Konohamaru quickly threw a kunai of his own at the Iwanin who was aiming to throw another kunai at Konohamaru. The kunai quickly flew through the air but missed the Iwanin and hit a pole next to Iwanin, thinking he was safe the Iwanin got ready to throw his kunai at Konohamaru. But what he didn't know was that Konohamaru had missed on purpose as the kunai had an exploding note wrapped around the handle. Just when the Iwanin was about to throw his kunai the note had exploded destroying the roof and killing the Iwanin. With the Iwanin dead Konohamaru turned around to see the rest of his group battling the remaining Iwashinobis. Konohamaru then quickly summoned Enma and had him turn into his Kongonyoi form and was about to join the battle and help his men, but before he could, his shinobi senses kicked in yet again and told him to move. Konohamaru quickly jumped away, where as soon as he did a massive Zanbato came down on the spot that he was just on. When Konohamaru landed, he looked up and saw a bulky and well-built Iwajonan with shoulder-length black hair, wearing a standard Iwajonan uniform and holding a massive Zanbato. When Konohamaru got a better look at him he quickly recognized him as Beragu the Saiseki, stone crusher, of Awagaku the hidden stone, the son of the Yondime Sukikage. Well, 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 this must be my lucky day it looks like I've found the infamous Kanoa no Enku, Kanoa's monkey king, Sarutobi Konohamaru, the grandson of the late Sandime Hokage and former Kami no Shinobi, god of Shinobi, spoke Beragu. And your Beragu the so-called Saiseki of Awagaku and son of the Yondime Sukikage, replied Konohamaru. Ah, so you've heard of me, good, since a man should who is about to kill him, your head will make an excellent trophy to mount on my wall of the shinobis I've killed. Just try it you bastard, snarled Konohamaru, as he tightened his hold on Enma as he got ready to fight. With pleasure, sneered Beragu, after which he charged forward with his Zanbato. Let's go Enma, cried Konohamaru. Right, replied Enma. After which the two shinobi clashed their weapons against one another and began their fierce battle. With Hinata, Juho Soshikan, gentle step twin lion fists, cried Hinata, as she trusted two lion-shaped shrouds of chakra that were around her hands, into a kusanin body, which set him flying and crashing into a nearby house. After sending the kusanin crashing into the stone house, four mercenaries hired by the Hanya clan surrounded her. Don't be afraid of her she just one woman, spoke the leader of the four men, when they surrounded Hinata. Clearly you have, not fought a member of the Huga clan, for if you had you would know that you should be afraid, spoke Hinata. Before she started to spin around and cried out, Hakusho Kaiten ate trigrams palms heavenly spin, and sent the four ninjas flying into the air before crashing down into the ground. When she stopped spinning Hinata suddenly jumped into the air to avoid several surikans throw at her from an unknown opponent. After which she quickly took out a kunai from her pouch and used it to block a clawed metal clawed hand that was thrust forward at her by her mysterious attacker. The mysterious attacker was still very strong though, since even though Hinata had blocked his attack, he was still able to push her back, causing her to fall from the air and skidded backwards when she landed back on the ground. When Hinata regained her footing, she was finally able to get a better look of her opponent, the man was very tall as he was about 6 foot 3, and he was well built with pale skin and long red hair done in several long braided tails. He wore a shinobi net vest with a gantlet on his left arms with a metal shoulder guard and side breastplate. he also had bandages on his right hand and a metal chain warped around it. He wore metal spike knee pads with metal clawed toed boots and heels, with black shinobi pants with red flames and a red cloth wrapped around his waist. Who are you? asked Hinata, as she did not recognize the man from any known bingo book. 
My name is Fuma Kotaro of Kusagakur, Hidden Grass, replied the man now known as Kotaro. At this Hanata eyes widened slightly as she had heard about Kotaro from passing stories from other shinobis. From the rumors that Hanata had heard about him, he was said to be a merciless killer that held no remorse for those he killed and was an extremely dangerous shinobi for anyone to fight. His reputation was said to be so fearsome that his own village and clan were said to fear him. You're the Keis no Akuma, the demon of the wind, asked Hanata openly and with slight surprise. Kotaro of course only nodded in affirmation. I thought you were only an urban myth, spoke Hanata. As no one who was said to have seen him outside his village and clan had ever lived to describe him or get a picture of him. Well as you can see I clearly am not, replied Kotaro, and I have heard a great deal about your skill and power, Huga Shikyo no Megami, Huga's goddesses of death, Huga Hanata, and I'm eager to see how much of those rumors I have heard about you are true. After which Kotaro the quickly fell into a fighting stance, where Hanata quickly followed suit as she knew she would have to be on her toes in this fight and could not afford to go easy or underestimate someone like Fuma Kotaro. For a monument or two neither of them moved, as they waited to see which of them would make the first move. But after seeing no movement from the other, they both simultaneous attacked each other, where they then began their vicious hand-to-hand -hand battle. From the small hill the anti-Kanoa coalition leaders watched as the battle continue on, from there they saw that although Kanoa forces and its allies were being pushed back slowly. They were holding strong, while their own forces had yet to make in real major breaks through Kanoa's defense lines and were suffering heavy losers. They also knew that Kanoa still had plenty of reserves held back, as from the reports they were receiving, they knew that so far Kanoa only had about a third of their forces out in the fighting. Seeing this Yondaim Suchikage, Ryoku suggested they should send in the second and third waves together to add on to the pressure on Kanoa forces and reinforce their own. The other leaders quickly agreed, where they then ordered the second and third waves to attack. Unfortunately what Orokimaru and the others didn't know was that they were falling right into Shikamaru's trap. As when the first and second waves joined the first wave in their attack on Kanoa forces, they suddenly found themselves being attacked by Suna and Kanoa Shinobi from the rear and were now caught between two enemy forces on both sides. The reason for this happening was that Shikamaru had calculated that if Kanoa put up a strong defense then Orokimaru and his allies would send in another larger force to support the first wave. This was why he had Kanoa forces be slowly pushed back and allow the enemy push deeper into Kanoa instead of holding the line, so that when the second and third waves joined the first wave and were pushing the Kanoa, Suna and Tsuchigamo clan shinobis further back into Kanoa. The several Kanoa and Suna divisions that Shikamaru had stay hidden in the underground bunkers, which were now behind the invading forces lines, since they had pushed deep into Kanoa came out and attacked the unsuspecting enemy shinobis, catching them in complete surprise and confusion. Once the enemy found themselves being attacked from the rear the defending Kanoa forces decided to take advantage of the enemy's confusion and began to push the invading forces back, pinning them between the two forces. Upon seeing their forces being outmaneuvered and being attacked from both front and behind, the four coalition leaders quickly ordered the fourth wave of their shinobi's forces to attack and help the other three waves. Shikamaru although had thought of this happening and had several shinobi teams, from the newly appearing Kanoa defenders, to be at the breaching points in the Kanoa walls and had them block the gaps in the walls with large-scale doton, doryuheiki, earth-style, earth-style wall. This cut the fourth wave off outside and kept them from assisting the other three waves inside the village and isolated them from the rest of their army and basically cooting the anti-Kanoa coalition army in half as about 9,000s of their shinobis were now fighting a losing battle against Kanoa and its allies, where without help they would be slaughtered. When Orokimaru and his allies saw this, many of them grew concerned at what was happening as knew that if they didn't do something soon then they would lose over half their army very quickly. It seems Kanoa has us a quite a quandary, spoke Orokimaru, who remained calm as he was not too worried at what happened. This must be the work of Kanoa's John and commander Nara Shikamaru, as he has a reputation of being a shrewd strategist, spoke Shinran without much worry, as the forces he sent weren't of his clan. Since in terms of numbers the Shinran's clan was the weakest member of the coalition, to make up for this Shinran hired shinobi mercenaries, which was what most of the 2,000 shinobis he had assembled was made out of. He had also arranged for these mercenaries to be part the first three waves, and had his own clan members, which numbered in about 300, to be positioned in the last two waves. This would make sure that many of the mercenaries would most likely be killed in the battle, while his clan would stay intact. 
It also made sure that he would not have to pay too many of the mercenaries, if any survived, since the fewer that survived the better, as Shinran's clan did not have the money to pay all the mercenaries he hired. Hence as far as Shinran was concerned, the mercenaries he sent in those first three waves were cannon fodder, as they were all weak shinobis who had left their respected villages because they were too weak or were simply kicked out. We need to do something now before we lose half our forces, spoke Doku. Agreed, spoke Orokimaru, where he then turned to Kabuto who was standing next, Kabuto-kun contact Gurun and tell her that to have our force move out and begin their attack. Kabuto quickly nodded and began to tell Gurun so on the radio. At the same time Orokimaru turned to Godai Mizukage Shiro and asked him to contact his other forces and have them attack. Shiro of course nodded and turned to his aide and have him give the order. With Shikamaru Shikamaru was currently now standing at the top of the Hokage's residence, watching the battle unfold and ordering the different defending forces to different position to defend the village. The reason he was doing this was because he was the best person to be doing it, as the Hokage was leading the battle on the western side of the village. Shikamaru watched from his new position as his hidden forces came up behind and engaged the unsuspecting enemy, catching him completely off guard. He also soon saw the massive walls of earth rise up from the ground and cutting the invading enemy forces from the rest of their army. Upon seeing this Shikamaru prepared to send in half of their reserves, who were located in the center of the village, waiting to know where to go, to finish off the enemy already inside the village quickly, before the rest of the invading army could destroy the earth wall and join up with those inside the village. Unfortunately though, just when Shikamaru was about to tell one of the Anbu next to him, to give out the order for half the reserves to move out and attack. Several massive blasts of water suddenly erupted into the air from the behind the Hokage's residence and directly below the Hokage monument. The blasts of water came from the large spring pool directly below the Hokage monument, once the water fell down Shikamaru and the Anbu with him saw five giant sea serpents, five, in the large spring pool. The giant sea serpents quickly then began to fire several highly pressurized streams of water from their mouths, which tore the building around them apart. Soon after seeing this, a Chunin ninja appeared in front of Shikamaru. Report, order Shikamaru. Sir, five large sea serpent summons have appeared in the spring pool directly below the Hokage monument and are destroying everything around them. Also a division of Kirigakur's Hidden Mist Shark 6 unit has appeared with them and are currently fighting three of our squads located there. We believe they must have used the underground spring from one of the nearby mountains to appear in the spring pool behind us and infiltrate the village. Sir, we need reinforcements there, as we can't hold them back for long, spoke the Chunin. Damn it, Orokimaru must have known how that underground pool in the mountains feeds water to the spring behind us, and he must have had the Mizukage send his shark nins to swim through the underground water tunnels. So to reach the pool and have them summon those sea serpents to attack us from behind along with those shark nins, thought Shikamaru annoyed, before he then turned to the Chunin. Go and tell the four Suna platoons that are under the Kazekage brother, sister, wife and former sensei command, along with a few our own platoons, who are in reserve and have them go and attack the shark division, ordered Shikamaru, to which the Chunanan went. Hopefully Temari and the others can hold off the shark nins long enough for our forces to deal with the other forces first, thought Shikamaru. After finishing thinking this, a dozen more explosions erupted in the center of the village. What is it now, said Shikamaru angrily out loud. When the smoke cleared he could see twelve giant snake summons appeared out of the ground in the center of the village and started to destroy the village and attacking their reserve forces. Sir look down there, cried one of the Anbu. When Shikamaru looked below the giant snake summons he saw Oto's entire army of five thousand shinobis coming out of the holes that the giant snake summons created when traveling underground and attacking the reserve forces. Shit they bypassed our main defenses by going underground and used the snakes to create underground tunnels for them to travel under, so that they could sneak up on our forces from behind, as they are too busy fighting the main force all around us, crap, Orokimaru and the others have planned this well, as the only chance we have in containing them in using our reserves in the center and since I sent some of the reserves to fight the shark nins. I have to divert forces from the main lines to fight the Oto forces in the center, thereby weakening the main lines, muttered Shikamaru in anger and annoyance. And just when Shikamaru thought things couldn't get any worse, yet another explosion happened and the other Anbu next to him cried out and pointed over to something, Sir look. 
When Shikamaru looked he saw the giant earth walls being destroyed one by one either by powerful jutsus or powerful exploding notes. With the earth walls down the fourth wave of invading shinobis from the different villages of the anti-Kanoa coalition started to pour in through the gaps. Shit, thought Shikamaru, before he quickly regained himself and the turn to the Anbu on his left side. You bull, I need you to go the Hokage, the Kazekage and Jiraiya-sama and tell them that we need their help at the center to fight off those troublesome snakes. Hi, replied the bull-masked Anbu before he then left. After which Shikamaru then turned to a turtle-masked Anbu on his right, you turtle, go to the communication center and radio our forces that are attacking the rear of the first three waves of the enemy, and tell them that they are to either run through or fight their way through those forces and fall back to our lines. Before the fourth wave attacks them from behind and they're slaughtered by them, said Shikamaru. Hi, replied the turtle-masked Anbu before he then shunshun, body flickered, away. This battle has just gotten a whole lot more troublesome, and if things keep going like this we're gonna lose, muttered Shikamaru. Before he jumped off the top of the Hokage's residence and headed for the southern side of the village Reino, Joji along with his and their fathers were and joined them in fighting against the Iwa forces. Upon receiving word from Shikamaru about what was happening and seeing the twelve giant snake summons in the center of the village themselves Sunid and Gara quickly headed for the center of the village. Gara had already killed one of the giant three-headed snake summons by using his futon, Renkudan wind style, drilling air bullet, leaving only one left, which Sunid left to her summons Katsuyu. When Jiraiya heard about the sneak attack, he too quickly left with Gamabunta, who had just killed another giant snake summons himself by using his Gamadosuzan, toad sword beheading technique, after which he left the remaining two giant snake summons to Gamakan and Gamahiro. At the same time as that the Kanoa and Suna divisions that had snuck up behind the enemy earlier were now making a break through the enemy forces and making their way back to their lines. So that they could help deal with the Oto Shinobis, who had appeared in the center of Kanoa, right behind their main defense lines. Although those Kanoa and Suna divisions had made it back to their own lines they had suffered losses as they fought their way back to their lines. Where they either lost Shinobis as they fought through the enemy, or some of them were cut off from the others and isolated from them and then killed. But even still most of them made it back to their lines, where they then proceeded to go to the center of the village and fight off the Oto Nins that were trying to attack the main defense lines from behind. When the three cage level shinobis reached the center, they quickly went to engage the giant snake summons. Jiraiya quickly got Gamabunta to fire a Gamaudan toad oil bullet at one of the giant snake summons, after which Jiraiya himself then fired a Katan, Endan, fire style, flame bullet with the Gamaudan. Thereby igniting the oil and creating an effect like a flamethrower, and creating a conflagration of far greater power and magnitude than the original fire ninjutsu used on its own could have. The enhanced fire ninjutsu quickly flew at the giant snake summons and quickly burnt it alive, leaving a charred remains that puffed away soon after. At the same time that was happening, Gara engaged the giant snake summons and once again used another futon, Renkudan to kill another giant snake summons, but as soon as he did one of the other giant snake summons snuck up on him by going underground. Where as soon as Gara had killed one of the giant snake summons, the other appeared out of the ground and wrapped itself around Gara's full shukaku form and keeping him from moving for the moment. Once it had wrapped itself fully around Gara full shukaku form the giant snake summons, opened its mouth and went to try and eat Gara, who was on his full shukaku's form head. Seeing what the giant snake summons was about to do, Gara quickly deactivated his full shukaku form, causing it to fall apart, into a large mountain of sand and allowing him to move out of the way and avoid being eaten by the snake summons. After avoiding being eaten Gara quickly used the sand that had originally made give up his full shukaku form and use it to create a sabaku ro, sand binding prison, to capture the snake summons. Once he captured the snake summons inside his sabaku row he then used his sabaku soso, sand waterfall funeral, and crushed the snake summons, killing it instantly. Once the giant snake summons had been dealt with Gara then went to help deal with the Oto shinobis that were now inside the village. Sunid did her own part in the battle against the giant snake summons, where she used her chakra to help her leap up high into the air and used her Sutankyaku painful sky leg, to hit one of the giant snake summons on the head, stunning it for a few seconds. After which Sunid then quickly did a mid-air spin kick and hitting it, stunning the summons in the side of its head sending it crashing into the ground and knocking it out. 
with another summons dealt with Sunid then quickly went to help take care of the Oto shinobis that were now infesting her village from underground like the cockroaches they were. With Yamato currently fighting on the eastern side of the village Yamato was currently leading three teams of Anbu against a platoon of Oto shinobis that had made their way to the eastern side of the village and were trying to attack their forces from behind. Yamato and his men quickly intercepted the force, where they then engaged them in battle. As Yamato battled an Oto Nin, the Oto Nin quickly did a few hand seals and the cried out, Doton, Karasru Earth Release, Dragon Crusher, A, after which a massive dragon made entirely out or earth erupted out of the ground and headed right for Yamato, reacting quickly Yamato did three quick hand seals and cried out, Mokuton, Mokujo Heiki, Wood Release, Wood Locking Wall. With that, a large dome shape appeared in front of Yamato and blocked the attack and protected him from it. Once the attack was stopped Yamato quickly did several more hand seals and the cried out, Mokuton, any no sashi, would release, impaling roots after which several large roots appeared out of the ground pierced the Oto Nin chest and impaled him. Once the Oto Nin was dead, Yamato was about to go help the rest of his men until suddenly he heard someone cry out, Shoten, Keshohari, crystal release, crystal needles, upon which dozens of long, sharp, and pointed bright pink and white crystals shot out of the ground around Yamato, where they tired for pierce him. Fortunately though thanks to the many years in Anbu and to the training he went through there, Yamato was able to use a Kawarimi no Jutsu, body replacement technique, to replace himself with a piece of wood, before he could be pierced by the sharp crystal points. When he landed several feet away, he suddenly heard someone laughing, when Yamato looked around he couldn't see anyone, until the person in question suddenly appeared in front of him. When the person appeared, Yamato saw that his assailant was in fact a woman. The woman was a tall woman with dull blue hair tied in a short ponytail and wore short red pants and black boots. She also wore a long green coat with a white furry collar and a large with flower design on it and had a yellow rope around her waist, tied in a bow. Impressive, you were able to dodge my attack like that but then again I should expect nothing less from the famed Mokuton no Tenzo, Tenzo of the wood release, not to mention that you are a former experiment of Orokimaru sama spoke the woman. Who are you? asked Yamato openly as he narrowed his eyes. My name is Gurun, I'm the commander of Orokimaru sama forces here, and your executioner if it comes to it, spoke the woman named Gurun. We see about that, replied Yamato as he took out a kunai and got ready to fight, which just caused Gurun to smirk mercilessly. Yes we shall, she replied, after which she then threw a dozen or so peculiar looking shurikens that resembled snowflakes, at Yamato. Quickly dodging some of the shurikens and blocked the rest, Yamato then quickly did several quick hand seals and the cried out, Mokuton, Mokapai would release, wood spike B, where a large wooden spike shot out of the ground and towards Gurun. Seeing this Gurun quickly sent out a wave of chakra and shouted, Shoten, Kesho Jinheki crystal release, crystal encampment wall which then turned into a large crystal wall in front of her. Where it blocked the wooden spike and to Yamato's great surprise it started to regenerate from the damage it suffered from the wooden spike. You're a Shoten user, spoke Yamato in surprise, as he had heard rumors, about a bloodline that allowed a person to use crystal ninjutsu, but he had always thought it was just that, a rumor. Correct and what more earth, water, and wood techniques are useless against it, as Shoten can crystallize any physical material and substance including the moisture in the air around us, which means that all your ninjutsu are worthless against me as all your ninjutsu are earth, water, and wood-based ones, said Gurun. As she knew all about Yamato abilities, as Orokimaru had ordered her to capture Yamato, or at the very least bring back his body so that he could find out what was it that allowed Yamato to survive his experiments when all the others failed so that he could then know how to create other Mokuton uses and prepare another new vessel in the future. Upon hearing this Yamato frowned as he had heard the same thing, about how earth, water, and wood ninjutsu were worthless against a Shoten user. But regardless if it was true or not he wasn't going to run or give up, he was going to fight and defeat her no matter what it took. Upon seeing Yamato falling into another fighting stance Gurun just smirked, so you still going to fight me even though you know that your elemental ninjutsu is worthless against me. Yamato didn't answer, and got ready to fight. You're brave, foolish, but brave, spoke Gurun as she then a few one-handed hand seals, much to Yamato's surprise and cried out. Shoten, Susho 2 crystal release, Jade Crystal Blade, where two blades made of crystal formed on her both her arms, after which she then fell into her own fighting stance. 
After a minute or so of just staring at one another the two raced towards one another a high shinobi speeds and clashed their weapons against one another. Gurren quickly used her left sushota to block Yamato's kunai, and then brought up her right one to slash at Yamato's abdomen. Seeing this Yamato quickly jumped away to avoid the slash, and although he was able to avoid it from seriously wounding him, Gurren was still able to slash his flak jacket and make a small cut on Yamato's stomach. When Yamato looked at Gurren he saw her bring up the susho to that cut him up to her face and started to sniff at it, after which she started to laugh sadistically, hey hey, I love the scent of blood. Not to be intimidated by her scare tactics, Yamato just fell into another fighting stance and got ready, Gurren quickly did the same. After a moment or two of staring down one another, the two of them started battling again. With Orokimaru and the others from their command point on the small hill Orokimaru and his allies watch as the Kanoa forces along with their allies were struggling under the weight of numbers against them and the fact that they were being attacked on all sides. Orokimaru then turned to Mizukij and the other anti-Kanoa coalition leaders, gentlemen, radio your men and have them fall back, please. At this the Mizukij and the other leaders nodded knowing what Orokimaru was going to do next and turned to their aides to have their forces temporarily fall back, after which Orokimaru then turned to Kabuto. Kabuto-kun, please inform the three curse seal divisions that we have in reserve to move forward, now that our allied forces have softened the Kanoa forces enough on the three fronts, for our curse seal uses to break Kanoa's lines there. After which we will send in all our forces in one final attack and utterly destroy Kanoa, one and for all. Kabuto acknowledged Orokimaru order and began to give out his order of the radio over to the leaders of those divisions. The curse seal divisions were three divisions made up of Oto shinobis and former prisoners that Orokimaru capture and placed curse seals on, turning them in vicious, brutal, bloodthirsty monsters, that would not stop until either their enemies were dead or they themselves were killed. The reason why Orokimaru was having his allies fall back was because, his crew seal warriors would be just as likely to attack their own allies as they were to attack their enemies. The only way Orokimaru was able to control them was because of small groups of Oto shinobis in each of the three divisions, who were still able to retain their minds after getting the seals, and who were placed in command of the three divisions to keep the other curse seal warriors in line. Once the Iwa, Kiri, Kusa and Hanya clan forces had fallen back on their three fronts, the three curse seal divisions moved in and started to wreak utter havoc and destruction on the Kanoa, Sooner and the Suchigamo clan forces causing heavy losses on the already weakened defense lines where they begin to crumble. As thanks to the curse seal the curse seal warriors, strength speed and power went far beyond the average shinobi's power, the seal also made it very hard for the Kanoa, Sooner and Suchigamo clan shinobis to kill. Since in their monstrous forms the curse warriors skin became extremely strong and tough, where only high level or powerful justus could kill them. After an hour and a half of bitter fighting the Kanoa forces and their allies, had somehow held their lines, but just barely and had just about killed the majority of the curse seal warriors, although there's still many left that were fighting, but still most of them had been killed. But it had come at a heavy cost as many of their shinobis had been killed or were too wounded now to fight, leaving them in a bad situation for the now refreshed enemy forces that were to come in. Seeing this from their command point Orokimaru and his fellow leaders ordered the first four waves to re-engage the weakened Kanoa defenders, while holding the fifth wave in reserve, in case one final push was needed. Once the anti-Kanoa forces re-engaged the Kanoa defenders, Orokimaru then turned to his fellow leaders. Gentlemen, I believe it's time that we ourselves join the battle and finish off Kanoa once and for all, don't you all agree? asked Orokimaru, where the other leaders of the anti-Kanoa coalition nodded their heads in agreement after which all five leaders and their aides headed off into Kanoa. With Sakura currently in the center helping with the endless number of wounded shinobis, Sakura, was desperately trying to do her best at stabilizing as many of them as she could and hand them over to emergency medic teams. That would deliver them to the emergency hospital in the Hockage Monument, although that in itself was a dangerous mission as with the Hydra ninjas fighting below the monument with the Suna and Kanoa forces, where the medic units transporting the wounded could be caught in the crossfire or attacked by Hydra ninjas. After sending another wounded Kanoa shinobi with a medic team back to the emergency hospital, Sakura was attacked by three curse seal warriors, that were still alive and had somehow broken through the main defense lines and had reached the center of the village. All three of them were hissing, growling and snarling at her like wild bloodthirsty beasts. 
Seeing this Sakura quickly prepared herself for battle and fell into a taijutsu stance, which was none too soon, since as soon as she did the trio of monsters charged forward and attacked. Reacting quickly Sakura charged an immense amount of her chakra into her fist, and cried out, Okasho, cherry blossom impact, and slammed her fist into the ground pulverizing it into miniature pieces, and blasted the three monstrosities away. Once the three cursed seal warriors were shattered away from one another, Sakura quickly charged forward toward the nearest one to her, where she then quickly jumped into the air and cried out, Sutankyaku painful sky leg. Where she did a falling axe kick, down on the crew seal monster, where thanks to her superhuman strength she caused a gigantic crater killing the crew seal monster she hit instantly at same time. As soon as she hit the monster Sakura quickly did an 180 spin around on her so to face the second crew seal monster that tried to jump at her from behind, where when she did. She charged up her fist again and slammed it right in the face of the creature and sending it flying into the air and into several buildings a hundred feet away. With the second curse warrior dealt with, Sakura quickly looked around for the third and final curse seal warrior. She did not have wait for a long as she saw the creature charging at her from her right hand side. Quickly charging forward Sakura ducked under the curse warrior's claw swipe and used her superhuman strength again to do a powerful high kick, while shouting out, Sakura no Joshoku rising cherry blossom kick. C. Blasting the curse warrior high up into the air, after which Sakura concentrated a large amount of her chakra to her feet too, allowed her to jump up to the midair curse warrior. Where once she did, and was slightly above it, she brought up her leg and once again cried out, Sutankyaku, hitting the creature dead on and causing it to fall rapidly to the ground and causing a large crater once it hit it and killing the former human instantly. When Sakura landed back on the ground, after defeating the third and final curse warrior, she suddenly heard someone clapping nearby. When she looked around for the person, she saw none other than Orokimaru right-hand man Kabuto applauding her with an arrogant smirk on his face, as he leaned against the wall of a building near where Sakura was fighting, where he'd been watch her the entire time. Upon seeing the silvered-haired traitor, Sakura narrowed her eyes. My, my Sakura-chan you have certainly improved a great deal, from the silly little fangirl I first met in the forest of death, who could barely fend for herself in a fight, let alone defend her teammates, spoke Kabuto in a playful-like manner, while still smirking. At this Sakura just growled, Kabuto, what the hell are you doing here? Shouldn't up be off being Orokimaru's little lap dog and licking his boots, spat out Sakura. Tisk, 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 is that any way to greet an old friend, how long has it been since we last seen each other five, six, seven years I think, one would think that you would greet me with something other than hateful remarks, spoke Kabuto, without Sakura's insult even phasing him. You're no friend of mine, team, spat Sakura out as she glared at him. Kabuto just continued to smirk as Sakura glared at him, it seems that Sunitsama has not taught you to respect your betters. As if I even respect you, retorted Sakura as she got into a fight stance. Oh, so you think you're good enough to beat me? Asked Kabutoi feigning surprise, which Sakura refused to respond to. After getting no response from her Kabuto just smirked again and did a few quick hand seals and activated his Chakura no Mesu, Chakra Scalpel, which Sakura quickly copies. For a moment or two the two medic nins just starred at once another, where Sakura glared at Kabuto, while Kabuto continued to smirk arrogantly at her. Soon after though the two medic nins charged forward and began their battle. With Sunid, Jiraiya and Gara currently Sunid was battling several Otosonic Anbu ninjas, seven by herself on the rooftop of one of the larger buildings in the village. Just as she had killed her 50th Oto nin, a cursed seal warrior leaped behind her and tried to attack her. Seeing this Sunid quickly spun around and was about to deal with the creature, but before she could a voice suddenly spoke up, Suheiki, sand wall D, where a wall of sand appeared and blocked the crew's warrior's attack. When Sunid looked around she saw Gara standing not far from her, to her left, with his arm stretched out. Gara quickly then held his hand out and spoke out again, Sabaku Q, sand binding coffin, where he quickly had his sand encase the cursed creature in a large amount of his sand, immobilizing it. He then used his sand to lift the now encased creature into the air, where he then spoke out calmly, Sabaku Soso, -so, causing the sand to implode and utterly crush the creature inside. You should watch your surroundings more hockage san, Kanoa can ill afford to lose its hockage, at this time, spoke Gara calmly, Sunid only nodded her head in acknowledgement and thanks for his help, even though she had not needed it. When Sunid turned around to her right she saw Jiraiya, 
who had jumped off Gamabunta not long ago, finishing off several Oto Nins that had foolish thought they could take the Toad Senen by themselves. At the same time Sunid saw Gamabunta severing the head of one of the giant snake summons with his katana, where after doing so he went and continued battle with the other remaining seven giant snake summons by himself. After seeing this Sunid then saw Jiraiya appear next to her and Gara on the rooftop of the building, things aren't looking too good for us Haim, our forces at the front are on the verge of falling apart. Thanks to those curse warriors that Orokimaru let lose on them and the first four waves of enemies are recommencing their attack on them. Not to mention that we're barely containing the Oto forces and the Hydra Nins that are attacking us here. We need to do something now to contain these forces here, and get back to the main lines before it's too late, spoke Jiraiya with urgency. Yes I know that Jiraiya, but these Oto trash are like cockroaches, where if we kill one, ten more appear, rounded Sunid, before she quickly calmed herself down, as the last thing she needed to do now was lose her cool. After which she then turned back to face Jiraiya, Jiraiya, can you and Gamabunta try and contain the Oto forces here by yourself, while Gara and I go back to the front lines and try and help out there. Are you kidding Haim, these Oto clowns won't know what hit them, as none can handle the overwhelming might of Jiraiya, sneered Jiraiya confidently. Sunid just nodded her head, as she knew Jiraiya could handle things here by himself, after which she then turned to Gara, who just nodded his head in understanding and was about to go with her back to the front lines. But before they could they suddenly heard and familiar laughter, coming from somewhere, before they could even look around to see where the laughing was coming from, Orokimaru, and his allies, the Yondaim Suchikij, Ryoku, the Godaim Mizukij, Shiro, the leader of Kusugaku, Doku and the leader of the Hanya clan, Shinran, appeared in front of them. Ku, 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 ku. So nice to see you again Jiraiya Kun and Sunid Haim and Yugara Kun as well, although I never had the pleasure of meeting you in person, spoke Orokimaru with a sickening smile. Orokimaru, snarled Sunid, what the hell are you doing here? My, isn't it oblivious, we've come to kill you all, and put on the final nail of Kanoa's coffin, replied Orokimaru. Like we will let you do that, growled Jiraiya, as he quickly fell into a fighting stance. At this Orokimaru only laughed, you make it sound like you have a choice in the matter, Jiraiya-kun, but still I can't help but feel nostalgic, it been about ten years since the three of us were all here like this, back when I tried to get Sunidheim to heal my injured arms. Although I think we're missing someone that was there that day, young Naruto-kun, if I'm not mistaken, perhaps I should bring him back, as I can do that, and then we will have everyone, said Orokimaru with a smirk. As he knew what this would do to Sunid and Jiraiya, as well as with Gara, at the mention of Naruto, as he hoped to spread salt on her old wound. Don't you dare mention his name, you have no right, you twisted bastard, and if you even try and use that jutsu, I swear I won't stop until you're nothing but a bloody stain on my fist, snarled Sunid angrily as she was barely able to restrain her rage, at how casually Orokimaru mentioned Naruto's name, and reminded him of how he was dead, not to mention the thought of him using, that, jutsu to bring Naruto back. Jiraiya growled at little, while Gara kept up his emotionless expression on his face, although Orokimaru could tell that the young Jinchuriki was also angry at the way his sand was moving about and looked ready to attack. It seems that you stuck a nerve with them, Orokimaru, sneered Shiro, as he found the situation very amusing like the others. Indeed, spoke Orokimaru, as young Naruto-kun was yet another victim of Sunid Heim curse necklace. It even more amusing, since he was betrayed by the very village he swore to protect, which just shows how decrypted this village has become. Upon hearing this Sunid was about to charge right at Orokimaru for what he said, only to be held back by Jiraiya. Sunid control yourself. He goading you, he wants you to lose your temper and attack him, that way you be easier for him to kill when you're unfocused and blinded by your rage, so calm down said Jiraiya, while still glaring at his former teammates, as like Sunid he wanted to kill Orokimaru for what he said as Naruto was a sore subject for not only Sunid but for him as well. Considering that Naruto was his godson, and how he had not been there for Naruto when he should have been when Naruto was growing up. Soon enough though Sunid calmed herself down, still glared angrily and hatefully at Orokimaru, after what he said. Orokimaru of course, ignored her glares and turned slightly to his allies, so gentlemen, who would you like to fight? I want Jiraiya, spoke Ryoku, as he took off his cage robe and hat to reveal his bare chest showing off his Hulk physique along with several numerous scares on it. 
also as well as showing his black shinobi pants and large gold belt on his waist with a bear's face engraved in the center. The Yondime Tsuchikage knew that Jiraiya was the one who had trained the Yondime Hokage, and wanted to have the pleasure of killing the man who trained his arch nemesis and the cause of his disgrace, as well as erase any trace or connection to Yondime Hokage from the world. I shall deal with the Kazekage, spoke Shiro, as he took off his own cage robes to reveal his blue samurai-like armor and black cape. Shiro had always wanted to test himself against the famed ultimate weapon of Suna, as he heard that very few shinobis could stand up to the Jinchuriki Kazekage. I shall handle the Godime Hokage, spoke Doku, as he was eager to test a special poison he had, in the hopes of using it against Kanoa's Hokage. I will also take the Hokage, spoke Shinran, as he was hoping to deal a deadly blow to Kanoa, by killing its leader, just like how Danzo had killed his father, who was his clan's leader. Very well then, and I believe I will take Jiraiya-kun as well, if you don't mind Ryoku-kun, spoke Orokimaru with a smirk. Fine. But don't get in my way or I crush you along with him, grunted Ryoku. Orokimaru of course just continued to smirk and he fell into a fighting stance. Soon enough though both sides faced off one another and prepared to fight, where after a minute of staring at one another, the eight leaders of their respected groups and villages attacked. With Tenten currently panting heavily with several cuts on her face, Tenten was staring at her opponent Jin, who was panting slightly and had a few cuts on himself as well, but was also grinning manically as he was enjoying this fight. Ha, 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 this is it, this is the fight I have been waiting for, fighting, someone who can match my strength and skill, and can actually kill me, I can finally test the true extent of my limits, spoke Jin as he continued to laugh. You insane, said Tenten as she stared at the laughing madman. Perhaps, or perhaps the whole word is insane and I the only one that is sane, as I'm true to what I am and I don't try and make myself to be some kind of hero. Shinobis are cold murderous assassins, our purpose is to kill and murder those that we are sent to kill and if we enjoy what we do then that's all the better, spoke Jin. You're wrong shinobis are more than that, the shinobis of Kanoa protected their own and will lay down our lives to defend the people and this village if need be, we are nothing like you, retorted Tenten. Well then I guess we are of a difference of opinion, so let's decide this little disagreement by finishing our fight, where the winner will be the one who was right, said Jin with a sneer, as he got his katana ready to fight again. Tenten of course did not reply to Jin's challenge, and just tightened her grip on her Jian and fan, as she ready to continue the fight. Soon enough the two of them clashed their weapons against one another once again, each time they either blocking or dodging each other's attacks, in some kind of sword dance of death. As Tenten blocked Jin right side diagonal slash with her Jian, Jin quickly used his Hashato backwards wield technique, which involved surprising his opponent. By passing his katana from one hand to the other behind his back real fast, allowing him to switch his attack whenever he wants, and surprising his opponent. Hence taking advantage of Tenton's unguarded left side, where he tried to cut her head off with the slash. Fortunately though, Tenton was able to bring up her metal fan and block his attack. Wanting to gain some distance from him Tenton quickly channeled her wind chakra into her fan and cried out, Sevufu, severing wind, e, and created a large slashing blade of wind and sent it flying towards Jin with great speed. Seeing the attack Jin quickly jumped up into the air to avoid the attack, but that was what Tenton wanted and she quickly threw her fan and chain at Jin which wrapped itself around Jin's katana as he was in midair. Tenton then sent her lightning chakra through her chain to her metal fan wrapped around Jin's katana, shocking him and forcing him to let of it. Once Jin let go of his katana, Tenton quickly pulled her chain to bring back her metal fan that was wrapped around Jin's katana. Whereas she did the fan and chain loosened and the katana fell and stabbed into the ground several feet behind Tenton. Not wanting to miss a good opportunity, to finish the fight, Tenton quickly charged forward with her metal fan and Jian sword at her top speed, and slashed at the unarmed Jin. Although when she did that, Jin, turned into a large piece of rubble, realizing quickly that, Jin had used a Kawarimi no Jutsu body replacement technique, and replaced himself with a piece of rubble from the village, Tenton quickly turned around. When she turned around she saw that he now had his katana back. Not wanting to give him the chance to use it again, Tenten quickly channeled more of her wind chakra into her metal fan and threw it, causing it to spin like a disc at Jin, when she threw her now spinning fan she cried out, Futon, Kaiten Fu Disuku, wind style, spinning wind disc F. Jin quickly dodged the attack, 
although when he did Tenton just pulled on her chain to come back and come at Jin from behind. Seeing this Jin quickly leapt into the air, whereas the spinning fan and chain passed underneath him, he quickly drew out several kunai and threw them at the chain. The kunais hit the links of the chain with pinpoint precision, pinning the chain along with the fan to the ground. As soon as he landed back on the ground Jin took full advantage of Tenton's surprise at what happened, and raced towards her at astonishing speed with his katana ready to deliver the final blow. By the time Tenton realized that Jin was coming at her, he was just about to slash her with his katana, Tenton was barely able to bring up her Jian sword to block Jin's attack. Although, even though she was able to bring her sword up in time to block it, Jin's slashing attack was so strong that it broke Tenton's sword in two and still slashed her in the chest. But thankfully though, Tenton was able to dodge the katana blade just enough to avoid the cut from killing her, or from being too serious, but was down on one of her knees panting heavily. As the cut was still serious enough, where Tenton knew that if she didn't get medical treatment soon, she would die from the blood loss of the wound. As Tenton put her hand over her large wound and ruined Anbu armor, that had helped protect her from a lethal cut, she heard Jin laughing manically several feet away from where she landed, after jumping away to avoid Jin's previous slash. Ha, 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 impressive you were able to avoid my slash that much, but still with that wound now, you won't last very long and this fight will be mine, said Jin as he continued to laugh. Don't beat on it team, said Tenton, as she ignored the wound and stood back up on her feet, where she then lifted up her arms slightly showing a silver bracelet, with a large red jewel in the middle of it, 8. She then quickly rubbed some of the blood from her wound that was on her hands and spread it across the jewels of both bracelets, where as soon as she did the bracelets expanded and turned into a large metal gauntlets with spike arms on their sides. The bracelets had been created by Tenton's father who after learning the special expanding technology developed in Kumogaku, Hidden Cloud created the bracelets to give Tenton a hidden extra weapon to use. As soon as Tenton's gauntlet appeared she quickly slammed her metal fist of her right hand gauntlet into the ground and using the superhuman strength she had learned from Sunid, and destroyed the surround street around her, causing Jin to jump away to a nearby rooftop. Upon seeing the entire street destroyed Jin could not help but laugh again. Ha, 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 so the rumors are true you do possess Sunid Sama monstrous strength. My strength not quite at the level of Sunid Sama or Sakura's, pant, pant, but it's still enough to deal with the likes of you, spoke Tenton. As she was panting slightly as she knew that she would not last long in a drawn out fight due to the amount of blood she was losing. Good, that the kind of talk I like to hear, as the more definite and determined you are the better the fight, which will make killing you all the sweeter, said Jin as he prepared himself and signaled Tenton to come at him. Tenton just responded by activating her wrist blades on her gauntlets and channeled her wind affinity in her left wrist blade, while she channeled her lightning affinity in her right wrist blade. Upon seeing this Jin's smile grew bigger, ho, 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 I can see now why you're called the Okami Ken no Kanoa, as you always seem to have some kind of bladed weapon on you, and by the look of this, this fight is about to get all the more interesting. Tenton only response to Jin's comment was to jump forward into the air cry out, Sevufu, creating another slashing bladed of wind and sending it at Jin, who quickly jumped to his left to the next building. Where as soon as he did, he saw the building he had been just on a moment ago was cut in two, right down the middle by Tenton's attack. Impressive, commented Jin with a smirk, when he saw it. If you like that how about how about this, cried Tenton, as she landed on one of the halves of the building she had just cut in two and thrust her right hand gauntlet forward and cried out, Razy but lightning saber, G. Sending out a powerful blast of lightning toward Jin, who narrowly avoided being hit and being blown to pieces by the powerful attack, although the roof of the building he was just on was completely destroyed. As Jin dodged Tenton's attack he charged forward at her so not to give her the space she needed to use her jutsu and went to engage her in close combat. While at the same time, covering his katana with his chakra, so that it could stand up to Tenton's, lightning and wind enhanced blades. For several minutes the two clashed blades with one another, where Tenton showed that despite her wound she was still able to fight well, as she and Jin traded blows with one another, where they either blocked or dodged each other's these few minutes Jin found it hard to find any openings to attack Tenton, as she had proven she was equally as deadly with her wrist blades, as she was with her Jian sword and metal fan. He was also finding it hard to protect himself as he had only one katana, while Tenton had two wrist blades. Soon enough though, the two of them broke apart to catch their breaths as they were both panting quite heavily. 
Pant, pant, while I have to hand it to you, pant, pant. Okami Ken, you certainly surpassed even my wildest expectations, as I didn't think I have this hard time with you, pant, pant, I don't think I've had this hard a time with anyone, outside the Kiri no Shinobagatana Nananan Shu, seven ninja swordsmen of the mist spoke Jin as he panted tiredly. Don't go talking like this fight, pant, pant, is over as I'm not done yet. Declared Tenton, although, right now she in a sorry state as she was still bleeding baldly from her wound and was feeling dizzy. Oh. Dot but I'm afraid it is as I'm about to show you the secret technique of the Nikaido Haiho, spoke Jin. What secret technique? asked Tenton. Allow me to explain, replied Jin, as you know the most well-known and feared technique of the Nikaido Haiho style is the Shin no Ippo, one side of the soul technique whereby using my Kenki, the spiritual energy that a warrior develops in a combat, on his opponent I can penetrate my opponent's mind, putting him in a paralyzed state and prevent my opponent from retaliating. Much like killing intent, but unlike that Shin no Ippo can also be used to kill my opponent. By concentrating all my force on his opponent, I can paralyze every muscle and every nerve in his body, causing them to stop breathing in a few minutes. But unfortunately this technique is useless against someone who is equal or strong than me in fighting strength, hence why I can't use it on you, spoke Jin, but was interrupted by Tenton before he could finish. What's your point? said Tenton angrily as she already knew all this and was in no mood of listening this. I was just about to get to that, said Jin with a smile as he brought up his sword to his face so to have the side edge facing him. You see the technique I'm about to use is called the Hyoko no Jutsu 9. By using the Shin no Ippo on myself, with my blade, I can hypnotize myself. This causes my reflexes to improve, and my strength to increase tenfold, making me invincible, allow me to show you, spoke Jin. As he brought the side of his blade to his eyes and cried out Shin no Ippo, where his eye glowed and there was a flash of light. Once the light died Tenton watched with horror as Jin muscles started to grow and expand. Now you see no one can stop me, cried Jin manically. Seeing this Tenton knew she was in trouble, and knew the only chance she had of beating Jin was to use the Hachiman Eight Gates. Tenton had learned how to do Hachiman after many years of hard and intense training with Guy and Lee, although unlike them, Tenton could only open two of the gates. But still she believed that would be enough to defeat Jin as the second Cuman, the Gate of Healing forcibly increases one's physical strength and temporarily re-energizes the body and that was what she needed. But the only problem was that with her body in its given condition she would only last a few seconds, hence she would have to make it count. Deciding to go for it, quickly going into a horse stance Tenton began to open the first gate, as her chakra started to flow around her Tenton began to open the second gate. As she was doing this Jin looked on in surprise as he saw the now visible chakra surrounding Tenton and then, and how her muscles started to grow and she seemed to regain her energy. Upon seeing this Jin started to laugh loudly, ha, 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 yes even now in your wounded condition you still have this much strength to fight, this must be the famed Hachiman, yes grow stronger Okami Ken, grow stronger so that the moment I kill you will be a moment of pure bless, ha, ha, ha. Quickly Tenton after finishing opening the second gate, she knew she would have to finish this fight with one finally strike, if she wanted to win, as he body would not last long. Let's finish this Jin with one last attack and we see which of us is the stronger, spoke Tenton. Hey, hey, yes let's, succumb at me with everything you got Okami Ken no Kanoa. Cried Jin as he charged forward to attack, as did Tenton. Clang, 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 slash, slash, slash. Within a blink of an eye the fight was over, both Tenton and Jin were standing at opposite ends of where they had started and had their backs to one another and not even moving an inch after their attacks. For a moment or two neither of them moved, until suddenly Tenton fell to her knees spitting out blood and cradling her side that had a new wound. As she fell Jin smirked without even turning, I got you. Why yes, yes you did, but I got you as well, replied Tenton painfully, which just caused Jin to smile more. That you did, but tell me what was that last move you used. Juamonji Giri cross slash h replied Tenton. At this Jin's smirk grew even bigger, aptly named. Well done Okami Ken no Kanoa, you won, said Jin, before his katana broke in two and two long cuts appeared. One going down the middle of his face to the middle of his legs, while the second going from one side of his stomach to the other forming a cross-like shape, after which a fountain of blood burst out of him. Before he fell to the roof floor dead with a smile of his face, 
as he believed it was a fitting end to a murderous assassin like him. Once Jin was dead, Tenton also fell to the roof floor bleeding badly, but even still despite the pain Tenton had a smile on her face, even when she lost consciousness from the loss of blood, but before she did one word went through her mind, I win. With Sunid, Jiraiya and Gara, Rendon, Suna Shiga, successive shots, sand drizzle, spoke Gara as he fired a grain of sand bullets down at the Shiro. Seeing this Shiro did two quick hand seals and cried out, Sutan, Mizu no Tatsumaki, water style, tornado of water I and created a spiraling tornado twice his size around him, where it protected him from Gara's Suna Shiga deflected him away from him. After which Shiro then had the tornado launch forward and attack Gara. Seeing this Gara quickly spoke out, Suna no Tama, sphere of sand, where a shield of sand quickly surrounded Gara, protecting him from the Mizu no Tatsumaki. Deciding to take advantage of Gara being unable to see what was going on outside his sand dome, Shiro did a single quick hand seal and waved his arms in several horizontal slashes and cried out, Sutan, Mizu Sereza, water style, water slicer. J, firing a dozen or so high-powered blades of water at Gara's sand dome. The blades of water quick spread towards Gara's dome at high speed and sliced right through Gara's dome with fright and ease, where as soon as they cut through the dome it began to fall apart into loose sand. After which it revealed a wounded Gara holding his chest, but before Shiro could even gloat in his victory, Gara suddenly collapsed and dissolved into sand. Suna Bunshin no Jutsu, sand clone technique, thought the Mizukij in slight surprise. After which he then heard Gara voice speak out of nowhere and say, Sabakuku, where a large amount of sand suddenly appeared and covered his body and kept him from moving, where after that Gara then appeared in front of him using a Suna Shunshin sand body flicker. With the Mizukage, caught Gara then stretched out his arm and spoke out, Sabaku Soso, thereby closing his stretched out and causing the sand to implode and crush the Mizukage. Although when it did Gara noticed that something was wrong as he did not see any blood, instead his sand was wet from water. It was then that Gara senses warned him of an impending attack, where before he could reaction properly, Shiro suddenly appeared behind him and quickly cried out Sutan, Mizu no Ken water style, water sword K, where a sword of made out of water quickly appeared in his hand. After which Shiro swung his water sword at Gara, whose sand quickly blocked the attack for him. With his attack blocked Shiro quickly jumped away, not bad Sabaku no Gara, Gara of the sand waterfall, but how about this? After which Shiro did a quick series of hand seals and cried out, Sutan, Taki no Jin water style, waterfall formation L, where a huge surge of water erupted in front of the Mizukage and like a giant torrent streamed down to the roof floor in one big cascade towards Gara, much like a gigantic waterfall. In doing so, it also resembled a huge wave, with tremendous power that it hollowed out the roof floor. As the mass torrent of water headed towards him, Gara quickly used Suna no Tama to protect himself from the massive water attack. As soon as Gara had sealed himself in his Suna no Tama, the Mizukage's attack smashed right into Gara's sand sphere and covered it entirely in water. Soon enough though the attack ended and Gara let his sand sphere down, although when he did he noticed that his sand was all wet and weighed down by the water it had absorbed from the Mizukage's attack. Seeing this Shiro began smirked, it seems that your ultimate defense, not much good to you now is it Kazekage San, as this was exactly why he had fired the massive water attack. So make Gara's sand wet, and weigh it down so that Gara could no longer move it as quickly as he normally would. After which Mizukage formed yet another Mizu no Ken and attacked Gara with it, only to be blocked by Gara's katana, which he had hung from his back and had now drawn out. Do not think I will be defeated, this easily by you, spoke Gara, as he held his katana over his head as he blocked the Mizukage strike, where he then pushed the Mizukage back. After being pushed back the Mizukage just sneered, not being the least bit worried, at Gara blocking his attack and still being able to fight, where he then charged forward at Gara and continued with his battle with him. Not far from where Gara and the Mizukage were battling, on another large building, Jirai was facing against Orokimaru and the Yondain Tsuchikage, Ryoku. Katen, Ruka no Jutsu, fire style, dragon fire technique, cried Jirai as he fired a blast of fire at Ryoku and Orokimaru. As the fire blasted head towards them Ryoku quickly did a signal hand seal and cried out, Doten, Doryuheiki, earth style, earth style wall, which blocked the fire blast and protected him from it. After the fire blast, Ryoku counted attacked, where he did another signal hand seal and cried out, Doten, Doryuso, earth style, 
rising stone spears where a dozen or so stalagmites appeared out of the ground in front of the wall of earth and tried to skewer Jiraiya. Fortunately though Jiraiya was able to avoid the attack by jumping up into the air, although as he did Orokimaru then fired his Senei Tajishu, many hidden shadow snake hands, at the mid-air Jiraiya, where they quickly wrapped themselves around him. Although as soon as they did, Jiraiya, exploded, revealing that he was a Bunshin Daibaku, a clone great explosion where the explosion destroyed the snakes wrapped around him. As soon as Orokimaru and the Suchikage realized that Jiraiya had switched himself with an exploding clone they quickly looked around to see where he went. They quickly found him behind them finishing doing some hand seals and then crying out, Doton, Yomi Numa, Earth style, swamp of the underworld, after which the surface of the roof floor turned into mud and creating a small swamp around them, causing Orokimaru and Ryoku to sink into it. As the two men sank into the mud swamp, Jiraiya quickly gathering oil in his mouth created by his chakra, and spat it out, and ignited it, while at the same time crying out Katen, Enden, fire style, flame bullet. Causing a large flame bullet to be fired at the two leaders, who were sinking into the mud. Although when they were hit and consumed by the fire attack, Jiraiya saw the remains dissolved into mud, revealing them to be Suchi Bunch and Earth clones. Shit Kawarimi no Jutsu, though Jirai angrily, whereupon realizing this Jirai then heard Ryoku voice crying out from behind him, Doton, Doryuden Earth style, Earth Dragon Bullet, firing several concentrated mud balls at Jirai from behind. Jirai quickly used Shunshin no Jutsu body flicker technique to avoid the attack, but when he appeared Orokimaru appeared behind and cried out Ketsugo Tekensho Hebi, binding striking snake M. After which a pair of snakes ejected out of Orokimaru's selves and wrapped themselves around Jiraiya's body, binding him with their bodies and then bit him in the neck. Upon doing so, Jiraiya, dissolved into a pool of mud himself, where he then appeared behind Orokimaru and did a quick spin kick, hitting Orokimaru in the back and sending hymns towards Ryoku. Orokimaru of course quickly did a quick spin flip in midair and landed beside Ryoku, who stood ready to continue the fight. Upon landing next to the Suchikage, Orokimaru, just smirked back at his former teammate, not the least bit affected by his kick. I believe that is enough playing around don't you think so Jiraiya-kun, spoke Orokimaru, with a sickening smirk on his face. Jiraiya of course did not answer, but smirk showing that like Orokimaru and Ryoku he was only playing around a bit so to feel them out, much like they had been with him. Soon enough after the three of them decided to get serious they recommenced their battle. Near where Gara and Jiraiya were fighting their opponents, Sunid was battling against Doku of Kusugakur and Shinran of the Hanya clan. As she was battling against the two men, Sunid quickly grabbed hold of a large piece of rubble, from the roof that she destroyed and threw it at Doku and Shinran. Both men naturally jumped out of the way of the large piece of rubble, after which Doku then inhaled a large amount of air and exhaled a poison mist at Sunid, while at the same time crying out, Dokugiri, poison mist. As the poison mist headed towards her, Sunid quickly held her breath, so not to breath in any of the poison and the quickly jumped up into the air to get out of the mist. But when she did Shinran was waiting for her with a jutsu ready, where he then quickly cried out Katen, Kariu Enden, fire style, fire dragon flame missile. After which he fired a stream of flames out of his mouth that took the shape of a dragon, Sunid tried to move out of the way, but Shinran was able to show impressive fire ninjutsu skill by controlling the fire and have it follow Sunid. But when the fire attack hit her, Sunid's burnt corpse turned into a burnt up piece of log, showing that Sunid hand replaced herself with a log. Seeing this Shinran quickly looked around for where Sunid might have went, when he looked around, he quickly found Sunid falling down toward him doing a falling axe kick and crying out, Sutankyaku. Seeing this Shinran muttered, shit, before he narrowly jumped out of the way of Sunid's attack, which destroy a large piece of the roof they were on, which was also the largest and tallest of the buildings that were around them. Not wanting to give up her advantage at being on the offensive, Sunid charged at Shrinan with her fist, but before she could hit him several kunai were thrown at her by Doku. Knowing that they were poison tipped Sunid skillfully evaded them with being cut by them. Impressive envision Hokage San, but I would expect nothing less from Kanoa no Namakuji Haim, Kanoa's slug princess, spoke Doku. After which Doku then did a quick set of hand seals before crying out, Doton, Dordanku Earth style, mud ball bullets. N and fired several large balls of mud at Sunid, who once again skillfully dodged the attacks. Not to be deterred Doku quickly inhaled again and exhaled another poison mist, after which he then did a quick few hand seals and the cried out Dokugiriru poison mist dragon. 
Oh, where by using the poison mists that he created. Doku used it to create a large dragon head made entirely out of poison and sent it at Sunid. As the poison dragon headed for her, Sunid quickly threw a kunai with an exploding note on it. As soon as the kunai hit the poison dragon, Sunid activated the exploding note, where it blew up and destroyed the poison dragon or blew away the poison. But as Sunid had done this, Shinran appeared behind her with his katana out and covered in lightning so to increase it cutting power, using Doku's attack as a diversion to distract Sunid, allowing him to catch her by surprise. Fortunately though Sunid was not a Sanon for nothing and quickly spun around to avoid Shinran's attack, where she then swung her arm around to hit him, but only to hit thin air as Shinran used a shunshun to avoid the attack and appear back next to Doku. That was close, muttered Shinran as he had just barely been able to manage dodging Sunid's fist. Well you hardly expect this to be easy did you? Asked Doku, she isn't the hockage of Kanoa from nothing. After dealing with Shinran, Sunid was then joined by Jiraiya and Gara, who were in turn followed by their own opponents, who then surrounded the three. Haim, we need to finish this fast, the village can't hold out for much longer if we don't go out there and help with the defense, spoke Jiraiya, all the while keeping his eyes on Orokimaru and Suchikage. Tell me something I don't know Jiraiya, snapped Sunid back, while watching Shinran and Doku. Listen Haim, can you and Gara here hold off these guys by yourselves for a few minutes for me, asked Jiraiya in a low voice so that Orokimaru and the others wouldn't hear him. I believe we could Jiraiya-san, but why, asked Gara. I'm going to use my Senen Modo, Sage Mode, but in order for me do that I need to gather enough energy to use it, where I have to remain perfectly still for several minutes, hence I need you to hold them off and buy me some time, said Jiraiya. At this Sunid nodded, as she was familiar with Jiraiya's Senen Modo, as Jiraiya had told her all about it a while back, although she had never seen him use it before. Gara was also familiar, with Jiraiya's Senen Modo, although he had only heard stories about it from elder shinobis of his village like Chio and her brother. Where from what he heard about it, when using the Senen Modo Jiraiya's power and strength increased dramatically, which was exactly what they need right now. Unfortunately though Orokimaru was already aware of what they were planning as he could read their lips and knew what they were saying, not to mention was well aware of Jiraiya's Senen Modo. Since before he left the village Jiraiya had told him all about his Senen Modo and was well aware how strong it would make Jiraiya. Hence he would not give Jiraiya the chance to use it, quickly doing a quick series of hand seals, Orokimaru, slammed his hand onto the ground and cried out, Dokuhebi no Kiba poison snake's fang. P. After which several snakes appeared out of the ground and bit on each of Sunid's, Jiraiya's and Gara's legs. What the devil, cried Jiraiya in surprise as the snakes bit his legs. As soon as the snakes had bitten each of their legs they quickly retracted back into the roof floor from whence they came, after which Jiraiya, Gara and Sunid, suddenly felt something wrong, as they struggled to breath and their bodies began to feel heavy. Poison, declared Sunid. Seeing the poison affecting his two former teammates and the Kazekage, Orokimaru couldn't help but smile in victory as knew he had this battle won. As soon as Sunid felt her body starting to get heavy she tried and gather her chakra to try and cure herself of the poison, but quickly found out that she could not summon her chakra. Seeing what Sunid was trying to do Orokimaru could not help but laugh, coo, 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 I wouldn't bother trying to heal yourself Sunid as you no doubt have realized now you cannot summon your chakra thanks to the poison that my snake's fangs were covered in. Orokimaru you bastard, what did you use on us, spoke Sunid angrily as her body was getting heavier and her was starting to find it hard to breathe. Coo, 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 only just a little concoction, that Doku Kun was so kind to give me, the toxin which he gave me was made out of the very rare flower the purple dragon lily flower. Sadly though we could only find three lilies which coated the fangs of my snake and infected you, but still they will do what I want. As I'm sure you know soon it heim the effects of that toxin and how fatal it is if not treated soon, spoke a smirking Orokimaru. Upon hearing this Sunid growled angrily, while at the same time became very concerned as she was familiar with the toxin, as it was widely used by Kusa during the Second Great Shinobi World War, which was why it became so rare. As the flowers were overused by Kusa during the war and they only bloom once a year in deep forestry areas in Kusa no Kuni grass country. The poison effects were slow, but in active combat the effects of the poison would accelerate, to due the adrenaline of a person. The poison would slow down a person's movements, while at the same time make their bodies feel heavier, it would also interfere with a person's breathing, where it could cause the person's throat to swell. 
thereby obstructing the person airway slowly suffocating the person and killing them, while also having the side effect of preventing the person from summon and using their chakra, which was why it was so valued at the time. I suggest that you surrender now, where if you do, we will grant you a quick and merciful death, before the poison kills you first, spoke Shinran. Like we ever surrender to like the likes to you, scoffed Jiraiya as he prepared to continue the fight, as if he was going down he was going down fighting and would sure as hell take as many of them with him as he could. Gara and Sunid were also of similar mind as surrender was not an option, this was a fight for survival, where they would either win or they would die. So you're going to fight right up to the bitter end, eh? spoke Ryoku, as cracked his knuckles and neck and then sneered, that fine by me. After seeing Jiraiya, Gara, and Sunid response, the other leaders of the anti-Kanoa coalition prepared to continue the fight and finish of the weakened leaders. At the eastern side of the village, Reikyo, lightning hound, cried Kakashi sending a bolt of lightning shaped like a hound at Akiri Nin, who tried to avoid it but could not as Kakashi was able to control his attack and had it follow the Kiri Nin until it hit and killed him. After dealing with the Kirinin Kakashi took a quick look around his surroundings seeing what was going on around him, and what he saw he did not like. All around him he saw hundreds of Kirinin swarming all around them, although the eastern front was still holding it was just barely as if something did not change soon they would be overwhelmed. To his left he saw Yugao killing a Kiri swordswoman with her former lover Hayat's katana, to his right he heard someone yell out Moju no Kiba, Beast Fang Q. When Kakashi looked over he saw that it was Kiba who was charging forward at Akiri Chunin with his claws out and did a cross slash ripping at the Manchester killing him. Once the Chunin was dead Kiba then called out Akamaru who was nearby, after which he used his Jinju Konbi Henge, Sotaro Man Beast Combination Transformation, double-headed wolf to transform with Akamaru into a large, two-headed wolf. Where after transforming into it they charged forward, and used the Garoga dual wolf fang, to pierce right through one of the two remaining giant summons that was right in front of them. With that snake summon dead the giant battle toad Gamma Hero was free to go help Gamma Bunter, who was fighting the snake summons in the center of the village, while also leaving the last snake summon in the eastern part of the village to Gamakan. Not far in front of him Kakashi saw Shino using his Mushidama insect sphere to cover Akiri Jonan with his bug and have them drain him of his chakra and then devour him, while still alive, until there was no trace. Seeing this Kakashi could not help but shudder slightly, as that was not a pleasant way to go. Nearby as well Kakashi saw Sai using Sumi Nagashi ink flush to bind several Kiri Nins with his ink snakes and then kill them with one of his Tantos. After which he then used his Choju Giga, Super Beast's imitation picture, summon several ink lions, to attack and kill some Kiri ninjas. That were sneaking up on a pair of unsuspecting Kanoa Anbu, who were busy fighting several Kiri Hydra nins. Quickly though Kakashi focused back at the battle at hand, he noticed a large group of Kiri Shinobis heading towards them, seeing this Kakashi prepared to fight them, but before he could a large hawk summons appeared above him where a dark figure jumped off it and attacked the advancing group of Kiri Shinobis, whilst the hawk summons, flew over to fight the last remaining giant snake summons with Gamakan. When Kakashi looked back at the Kiri group that had been heading towards him and the others, he saw that the figure that had attacked the Kiri Shinobis had been Sasuke. When Sasuke engaged the Kiri group he quickly used his Katen, Gokaku no Jutsu, fire style, great fireball technique, to cause the Kiri group to scatter, so to avoid the massive ball of fire. Unfortunately through, two Kiri Nins were not so lucky in being able to avoid the attack and were hit by it, where they were burnt to a crisp. Quickly though the Kiri Nins reorganized themselves, where several of them used the kunai launches that they had and fired them at Sasuke. Sasuke though quickly drew his Chokuto and skillfully dodged or deflected all the kunai fired at him, without getting as much as a scratch. Seeing this, a dozen or so Kiri swordsmen charged at Sasuke with their katanas, for the next few minutes Sasuke fought with the Kiri swordsmen with his chokuto, where with his superior skill in it he was able to kill several of the Kiri swordsmen. Soon after though, Sasuke used his Kusanagi no Surugi, Chidori Katana Kusanagi Sword, 1000 birds katana, so to increase the cutting power of his chokuto. Within a few minutes Sasuke had killed the remainder of the Kiri swordsmen that had attacked him, by using his lightning-enhanced Chokuto to cut through the Kiri Shinobi's katanas with ease. Just as Sasuke had finished up killing the last of the Kiri swordsmen another Kiri Nin came up behind him and tried to sneak up on Sasuke from behind and stab him with his Tanto blade. 
Unfortunately for the Kirinin, Sasuke was well aware of what he was trying to do, and just when the Kirinins was about to stab Sasuke in the back, Sasuke quickly turned his sword in a reverse grip and then stabbed backwards right in the Kirinin's gut, who could not see it until it was too late thanks to Sasuke's black cloak blocking his view. As soon as he had done that three more Kiri shinobis, who had been hiding in the buildings around Sasuke, appeared with their kunais in hand out of the buildings and attacked Sasuke from all directions. Seeing this Sasuke then used his Chidori Nagashi 1000 birds current to release his Chidori in every direction around him. So that when the Kirinins touched the Chidori their bodies would misinterpreted the lightning nature as electrical signals from the nerves, making their muscles contract, causing their bodies to involuntarily go stiff, while at the same time receive severe damage. When the paralyzed ninjas fell to the ground Sasuke took his Chokuto out of the gut of the now dead Kiri ninja and finished off the remaining other Kiri nins around him. Quickly after that, several more kunai were fired at him by three Kiri shinobis with kunai launches on a nearby rooftop, Sasuke of course quickly used a high shunshun no jutsu fire body flicker technique to dodge the kunai. Sasuke then reappeared, a few rooftops behind the Kiri ninjas with the kunai launches, where he then fired his katan, Goruka no Jutsu, fire style, great dragon fire technique, which completely destroyed the building the Kiri Nins were on and killed them along with it. After using his katan, Goruka no Jutsu, Sasuke noticed two Kiri Jonans to his right, where he then used his Kuchios, Raiko Kenka, summoning, lightning blade creation, to summon several Shurikens at them. The two ninjas of course dodged the Shurikens although, what they didn't know was that Sasuke had translucent strings on the Shurikens, and was using his Soshuriken no Jutsu manipulated Shuriken technique to have the come behind the Jonin and wrap themselves around the two. After which Sasuke then used his Katen, Ruka no Jutsu fire style, dragon fire technique where the two Jonins were nothing more the charred remains after the attack. When the two Jonins were dead, Sasuke noticed another Kiri Shinobi at the corner of his eye, preparing to fire his kunai launcher only a few feet away from him. When he saw this Sasuke quickly used his Chidori Iso 1000 birds sharp spear and fired it at the Kiri ninja, where it pierced right in the head, killing him instantly. Once the other Kiri shinobi was dead four more appeared on the rooftop, where they all quickly used Sutan, Sweeban water style, water whip to capture and subdue Sasuke, unfortunately though Sasuke did a quick jump to avoid being caught by the water whips. After which he then fired Katen, Hosenka no Jutsu fire style, Phoenix Immortal Fire Technique while still in midair at the Kiri Ninjas. When the Kiri Nins saw the attack coming they all quickly fired Sutan, Sudan Water Style, Water Bullet, R at in the incoming fire attack. The water attacks all hit all their marks, but when the balls of water hit the flames and extinguished them. The Shurikens hidden in the flames continued on towards the Kiri Nins, who could not avoid in time, where three of them were cut slight while the fourth was hit in the neck by one of the Shurikens. Before the Kiri Nins could even retaliate, Sasuke fired several Chidori Senbun, 1000 birds Senbun, at them, causing the one of the Kiri Nins left arm to go numb, the other Kiri Nins right arm to go numb as well. While the thirds was hit in his right leg, preventing him from moving very fast, which Sasuke took advantage of this by speeding towards the Kiri Nin and stabbing him with his Chokuto. After which Sasuke ran at the remaining two nins and while ducking underneath the punch from the first ninja he then kicked the other one away, after which he then spun around and charged up his Chidori, 1000 birds, and rammed it right in the stomach of the first man, where he then fell dead on the roof floor. Seeing his comrade fall the final Kiri Shinobi charged at Sasuke with a kunai in his one usable hand. Seeing this Sasuke then used his Magen, Kasegui, demonic illusion, shackling stakes to stop man in his tracks, preventing him from moving and making feel the physical pain of spikes being run through him. Once the Kiri Nin was frozen in place, Sasuke charged up his Reikiri, lightning cutter, that Kakashi taught him, and rammed it into the Kiri Nin chest, killing him. Once all the Kiri Shinobis were killed Sasuke left a rooftop to find more. When it was all over Kakashi could only sigh, as he had to admit that Sasuke was an amazingly powerful ninja, where he wasn't exactly sure that he could even beat Sasuke. But even still that did not mean he liked the way Sasuke turned out, as he was cold uncaring to everyone around him, and surrounded himself with darkness, where the only thing he cared about was killing his brother Itachi. In a way Kakashi blamed himself for how Sasuke turned out as he had given Sasuke far too much leeway when he was younger, when it came to his attitude and how he should have focused on getting Sasuke to value comradeship and valuing others. 
But even then he was unsure that would have gotten through to Sasuke, as the darkness that was in Sasuke's heart and so focused on his revenge where it was firmly set in his heart long before Sasuke became his student. Putting aside his mistake over Sasuke aside Kakashi quickly put his focus back at the battle, where he went over to support Yugao. For the next 15 minutes the battle at the Eastern Front raged on, where despite the odds the line still held, and the Kanoa Shinobis along with their allies continued to fight on. But even despite their heroic efforts the line was about to collapse. Kakashi, cried Yugao, who was bleeding slightly on the side of her head and was no longer wearing her mask, due to it breaking. What is it Yugao? replied Kakashi meeting her on the roof of a large house which had a clear view of the eastern gate. The Oto forces have broken through center and are about to attack us from behind, where we're going to be caught between two forces. But what about Tenzo and his group? asked Kakashi. Tenzo is currently fighting the leader of the Oto forces a woman that can use Shoten, while his teams are being overwhelmed, most of them are now dead and those that are left and fighting the Oto nins, replied Yugao. Shit. If we're caught between the Oto forces and the Kiri forces we be slaughter, and they're nowhere we can fall back to. As we're being attacked from the front and behind and even if could retreat somehow, the line would collapse if we did, thought Kakashi before he then came to a hard decision, one he never hoped to make. Yugao, go gather everyone around our sector and have them gather here, we're going to make our last stand here, spoke Kakashi, where Yugao nodded in understanding, knowing what that meant. Soon enough Yugao had gathered all the remaining defending forces of Kanoa in Kakashi's sector, out of a force of 250 shinobis that he had been in this sector at the beginning of the battle only 70 were now left, all the others were either dead or too wounded to fight, while the other forces in the other sectors, were cut off from them. The remaining defenders were made out of mainly Kanoa shinobis along with a dozen or so sooner shinobis and two or three Suchigamo clan shinobis. Among them as well were Kiba, Sai, Shino Sasuke and Yugao. Soon after gathering together the defending shinobis came under attack from the Kiri shinobis and the Oto shinobis on both sides. For several minutes there was fierce fighting between the two sides. As Kakashi killed another Oto nin with his kunai, he heard Yugao call him out from the rooftop he had be talking to her on earlier. When Kakashi jumped up to her on the rooftop, he looked to where she was pointing to, with defeated look on her face, when Kakashi looked his heart sunk like a stone in water, as all hope of survival was gone. As when he looked to the Kanoa Eastern Gateway and the breach in the Eastern Wall, which Yugao had been pointing to, he saw the fifth and final wave of Kiri Shinobis moving into the village, and if they were moving forward so were the other waves on the other sides of the village, Kanoa was doomed. At the same time Kiba, Shino, Sai, Sasuke along with several other Kanoa shinobi stopped fighting to see what was most likely the doom coming towards them. The Kiri and Oto shinobis on the other hand were encouraged on with the sight of reinforcements arriving, where they began to fight with even more enthusiasm. But just as all hope was lost, the fifth wave of Kiri shinobis were about to enter the village gateway and the breach in the eastern wall. There was a sudden bright flash of light from the sky and a large explosion at the Kanoa Eastern Gate and in the breach in the Eastern Wall, which killed a dozen or Sakiri shinobis who were just entering the village. The bright flash was then followed by a dozen more bright flashes of light and many more explosions. What the hell? cried Kiba out loud when he saw what had happened. Kakashi, look up there in the sky, cried Yugao pointing up in the air. When Kakashi, looked up along with everyone else there, he could not believe what he was seeing and thought he was seeing things at first, but he quickly realized he wasn't. Insert Gundam OO Ost 229 counterattack for right above the village and flying in the sky were 11 new Kumo airships along with over a hundred Skyhawk ninjas flying around them in their portable wing gliders. At the same time, they also the airships firing their lightning cannons, down on the now confused and disorganized Kiri forces, as well as firing their volley guns, along with the new Kumo ninjas on the catwalks, who were firing the jutsus and dropping bombs down on the Kiri forces. Along with them as well were the Skyhawk ninjas who were also firing jutsus and dropping bombs on the fifth wave on Kiri forces. It's new Kumo, they're here, and they're fighting on our side, we're saved, cried a Kanoa shinobi who saw the new Kumo airships and Skyhawk ninjas arriving and firing down on the Kiri forces. Thank the stars, spoke Kakashi with clear relief, but still why are they here? I would think that was oblivious Hitaki-san, spoke a voice, where when Kakashi and the others looked around they saw none other than Akechi Mitsuhide standing on the rooftop of a house near them, along with Mayoshi Sayuri and two other people that Kakashi and the others did not recognize. 
One was a young man in his earlier thirties, who was dressed like so kind of noble, he wore white shaitagi, a black kasod, a black hakama, a white hakama himo, white tabi, and waraji and a white hauri over the black kasod. He had long shoulder-length black hair in a white headpiece called a kenseiken and wore fingerless white gloves that covered only the back of his hands and wore a scarf. He also carried a regular katana with light blue handle and with a simple cross guard, with a simple open frame, much like a four-pane window. The other was a tall younger man in his early twenties with spiky orange hair wearing black shinobi pants and vest along with a kumo jonan vest and a long-sleeved, ankle-length black coat over the vest, which flare out into ragged ends at the bottom and had with red lining on the inside. Kakashi also noticed that the orange-haired youth also carried a long katana with a black blade. Mitsuhide, spoke Kakashi, with clear surprise as he had not sensed any of them. That will be it for this video if you want more comment down below, like, subscribe. And see you guys later.